coming up on episode 61 of Creative Writing. There's just so much opportunity to perfect things that don't need to be perfected. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. At what point does it become worth it to then spend that money to not have to spend the time that it takes to do it? One by one, the start are disappearing from the horizon. Hello, and welcome to Create If Writing, the podcast for writers, bloggers, and creatives who want to build an online platform, but without being smarmy. I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant, and I'm so So glad that you're listening today. Hey, how's it going? I don't know what you're up to this week, but I would love, 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 love to see and know what you're doing when you're listening. So feel free to tweet at me at Kiki Mojo with a picture or just tell me what you're up to while you're listening to the podcast. Today, I am doing an interview with Bjork Ostrom, and this is actually another one of the throwback episodes uh, or interviews, I guess, that I did last summer for the Business to Blogger podcast. If you don't know who Bjork Ostrom is, he is at the helm of Food Blogger Pro, which is a membership site and really a fantastic blog and a podcast. And he and his wife, Lindsay Ostrom, run the site Pinch of Yum. So they kind of collaborate together on the two different blogs and sites. And you'll hear in the interview how they handle that. So in this interview, which is one of my favorites and has a lot of laughter and goofiness, you're going to hear how to continually get better at what you're doing, knowing when to spend money and when you need to scale back, and also some tips for membership sites. So there's a lot of great information in here that I feel like applies to whatever niche you're in and whatever kind of space you're in. There's some really great general principles of just work ethic and how to get things done. If you want to find the show notes, you can head over to createifwriting.com forward slash 061. This is a bit of a long interview, so I'm just going to get right to it. And also I want to let you know on Thursday, this is coming out Monday, episode 61, but on Thursday, I've been doing a kind of a bonus mini episode and I'm going to do the kind of, it's not an outtake, but we had this whole side conversation that just got fun and weird. So I'm going to include that for Thursday. So now you're going to get the practical stuff Thursday. You'll get a little bit more fun stuff. Today I'm talking with Bjork Ostrom from Pinch of Yum and Food Blogger Pro. How are you doing today, Bjork? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast, Kirsten. I'm excited. I'm excited too. And it's fun because I've been listening to your podcast. And so it's really weird hearing your voice like responding to my voice because I'm used on the to other just, side. Yeah, I know. For sure. Yeah. I'm used to just listening to you and hearing you. But right. This is live. Yes, it is. So I feel like we're old friends, but um, I know we're not. But I'm super excited that you took the time to talk to me today because every time I listen to your podcast, and in case you're listening, to this podcast and you have not heard it, what are you doing? You need to go right now and go listen to the Food Blogger Pro podcast. And it doesn't matter really if you're a food blogger or not, because really what you get into on the podcast is all kinds of things related to blogging and just really detailed, awesome things that I don't hear anybody else talking about. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for following along and listening. It means a lot. Um, It's been a really fun uh, thing for me to get into. I enjoy the podcast world, the conversation world, the um, the the audio version of all things online uh, a little bit more than I do the the written version. So it's been a good medium for me uh, to explore and to play in. And it's a great way to connect with people. Maybe you, I don't know if you found that to be true too, but if there are people that are listening that have thought about podcasting. There's it's not just the content; it's also the connections. That's a huge win. So it's, it's it's been a good thing for us and appreciate that little plug there. Yeah, I, I agree as well. The connections are really cool and y- cool is such a terrible word. <laughs> Why is that? It? No, it, well, it's cool like <laughs> K-E-W-L. It's totally is, that kind of cool. Uh, it's cool is the <laughs> cool version of cool. So It is. It is. Yeah, so, so now that, no, that was cool. everybody yeah. really wants to start a podcast now. I feel like right. this has just convinced them. But um, yeah, there's just... I feel like I've been able to talk to people that I've admired for a really long time and a few people that I've actually already met in person, but I have done, you know, some people that I'm just like, hey, I'm a big fan. Let's do a podcast interview. And they say yes. And I'm like, I'm surprised every time, but I really haven't had, I think I've had one person say no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's, I think one, it's one of those things where, uh, people understand that you that they need to connect with other people and and there's this you know kind of like the bees cross pollinate when they go to different flowers i feel like um not that that's the most manly analogy that i can use but 
Uh, but I think it's the same thing with podcasting where, it, you know, I'm speaking to somebody right now that's never heard me speak and doesn't know our story. And uh, I think that's really powerful. And it's also, it's, it's, it's not easy to be in, in, on your side necessarily to ask the questions, to reach out to people, but it's relatively easy just to come on a podcast and share your thoughts and ideas and talk. And, um, I think especially when you contrast that with like doing a guest post or, you know, everything that was kind of in version one of the web, which was a little bit more involved um, and took a little bit more time. But for us, we can jump on a call and we can have a conversation for an hour and um, hopefully help some people out. And it's helpful for you and it's helpful for me. So it's a, it's a unique win, win, win. Yeah, I agree. And it does take less time. I think for me, if I'm writing a guest post, that takes a really long time. And I, I feel like this, this takes less time. Um, so if people, you know, it, it takes less time out of your day. And it also, I think that, people keep saying this. I went to podcast movement this summer. And if you, you, I don't think you went this year, but you really should go next year. It was, it was really amazing. But one of the things that people kept talking about was the idea of podcasting sort of bringing in intimacy that you just don't get. And it really does. I find that to be so true. You know, as you're listening to people, you really do start to feel like, you know them because yep. you're hearing their voice and it just it brings a new perspective. And I also, you know, in a time where I'm so busy, it's really hard to read blogs. I can listen to podcasts so many hours of the day because I'm in the car or I'm at the gym or I'm doing dishes and, you know, I can't be reading a blog, but I can be listening to somebody talk about their blog, which is great. Absolutely. And, you know, we will get messages from people that are like, I was going for a run on the beach this morning and I was listening to the podcast. And for us, it's been the first time that we've been able to remove. And when I say us, I mean, so my wife, Lindsay, does Pinch of Yum, um, the food blog, and then I do Food Blogger Pro. So um, it's the first time that we've been able to remove ourselves from the screen. So everything that we've done before has been reliant on somebody either having a phone in their hand or a computer in front of their face. And it's the first time that we've disconnected from that. So now we can be Like you said, in the gym, we can be in the kitchen, we can be uh, with somebody on a run, um, on their commute. And I think that's a really powerful thing and that intimacy is so important in building trust, which is such an important element of um, building something online because uh, the more trust that you can have, the more people will uh, trust you in that relationship and that trust in that relationship element is so important for building something and connecting with people and and influencing people and having an impact, which is what we're here to do, right? It is. It is. And so I want to talk to you today about an idea. And, you know, did you come up with this idea? Because I Googled it and I only found you. Was this sort of your invention, the 1% infinity? Yeah, I think what it is, is it's giving um, a, a real easy to understand, hopefully easy to understand concept around an idea that's universal. So the idea of 1% infinity is this idea that you're improving a little bit every day over a long period of time. The little literal phrase 1% infinity is something that a concept or an idea that, that, that I came up with that I think helps to paint the picture for people that are having trouble visualizing what that looks like. Um, and I think it, it helps to alleviate the, the, the burden that people feel that are in this space. And I say this space with quotes because it's such a broad, um, you know, net that we can grab people and, and include in our circle, but it's content creators, it's artists, it's people that are trying to build something online. Um, people that are in this space know that it takes a really long time and know that they have to do it each and every day. But what does that look like and how does that work? And the concept that we come, came up with and the concept that we adhere to is this 1% infinity. The idea that each and every day you're not trying to do something huge. You're not trying to um, you know, jump from one place to the other. You're taking a couple small steps forward. And after a few years, when you look back, you're like, oh my gosh, I've covered a lot of territory. Might not look like it each and every day. Um, but I think it helps to alleviate that burden where people feel like I need to go from zero to 1,000. They know that they need to do that. Um, But if they don't get to 1,000 within a week, then they feel like they've failed. And if if you think of 1% infinity, it's those small steps and and it's small wins along the way that will get you to that 1,000, whatever that is for you. Yeah, I love that concept. And I really feel like you need to go trademark that and get some t shirts made. Yeah, I know. We should do it. We have the we have the like generic domain names for it, but we should probably do something with it, move forward on it. No, you yeah. really should. Because I Googled it because I was like, 
Is that his idea? Because there's an article where you talked about this at Pro yeah. Blog School, and I'll leave the link to that article, the post that you did there, which was great. But I sort of thought it just seemed like such an amazing idea. I assumed, like, not that you couldn't come up with it, because of course, I think you're brilliant. <laughs> oh, but I yeah. mean, you know, I was like, this seems like one of those ideas that's everywhere. So who, you know, came up with it? Because I've, I've actually heard some people speak that talked about an idea as though it were their own. And then I go look and I'm like, yeah, they did not come up with I mean, even with a specific name that somebody else came up with, but they didn't reference the creator of it. So I just assumed it was like, you know, this is making me sound like I made all these assumptions, <laughs> like you couldn't have come up with this. And then you stole it. But I, I knew it was you. So this isn't really your... So who <laughs> did you get this idea from? This is what I really want to do for the podcast. Tell me who you're stealing your ideas from. Perfectly. Yes, it's an it's an expose. I did not tell you. This is one of those podcasts where yeah. we reveal deep secrets and we're going to have... We've got guests online. Are you, have you interviewed my family? <laughs> this is going south, man, really fast. Yeah. But um, no, so all that back to say, really, you need to get this trademarked yeah. and that should be a thing because I do. I think it's, it's a concept people can get behind. For it's sure. a concept that makes growth seem attainable in a time where we do feel really overwhelmed. And, you know, I feel like this month I've been doing, I had a lot of things kind of going and I feel like I've been going at like 80% and there's no infinity sense, like 80% and then like death. Yeah, right. I'm about yeah. to crash. And I know that, I know the percent I'm running on right now is not um, infinity. I can't sustain it, but I need to kind of get to that yeah. sustainable. What, what does that look like daily? And so Thinking about, you guys have, so Lindsay started Pinch of Yum, and that really took off. And then you guys kind of together, like you came on board, and I think you say generally you do about 10% or 20% to her 80 or 90. And then you have Food Blogger Pro, yep. which is a membership site, and you do kind of 80, 90, and she does 10 to 20. So yeah. percent of the work on those. But what did the sort of 1% infinity look like for you guys as you started out and kind of moving toward where you are today? Yeah, for sure. So when we first started, Lindsay started Pinch of Yum, and we didn't have any idea that we wanted to do Food Vlogger Pro. So the real quick chunks, like if we were to chunk out kind of our story, would be beginning. And in the beginning, Lindsay was interested in food, recipes, and sharing those. I was interested in um, all things online. So web design, web development, online businesses. Uh, I would I just lean towards geek a little bit in terms of like even the podcasts I listen to. Like I love tech podcasts that talk about like, you know, rumors about Mac products that would come out and stuff like that. So just out of interest, I would listen to um, social media experts or uh, people that would talk about web design and things like that. So that was real beginning stages and something else I was interested in. And then Lindsay had this interest in food and those two things kind of came together and we were like, God, we should, you know, I don't know if it was Lindsay or if it was me that had, that said, we should start a blog. And so it's like I set something up and then she kind of took it and ran and I didn't really have much to do with it for probably the first year, just kind of little things here and there. And it was definitely a hobby blog. But then Lindsay really started to hustle. And, and so I would say that would be phase one, would be just like initial concept, kind of interested, um, listening to podcasts, ebooks, uh, things like that, or audiobooks. Um, and then phase two is kind of this like, um, hey, let's actually try and do this. And for Lindsay, that meant um, really trying to figure out what, is it, what does it look like to try and get somebody to comment on your blog? Like, how do people get people to comment? So it was starting to interact with other bloggers. Um, trying to improve her food photography and get a little bit better at that. And um, so she she started to take steps at trying to kind of perfect the craft. And I think during that phase, um, we were both working. So the 1% Infinity looked a lot like fitting in the things that we wanted to learn in the time that we had. So for me, I was at a nonprofit. My job was fairly flexible in terms of what I focused on. So I would request work items around the things that I was interested in. So the nonprofit that I was with, they needed a website redesign. So I was like, can I take this project on so I can learn WordPress and how to redesign a website? I would listen. It was a, like a 45-minute commute. So I'd listen to podcasts and audiobooks on the way home and the way back. Um, Lindsay took um, some photography classes and, and did a lot of research on what does it take to you know uh, get a good photo and write a good recipe um, and spent her early mornings and late nights uh, working on the content and weekends working on the content for the blog. So in that phase, it, it was kind of like the building phase for us um, in terms of what 1% Infinity looked like. And then there's this phase where it kind of tipped into into actually being a business where we started to create an actual income from the food blog. So with Pinch of Yum, that was around the time where we started to earn maybe like 1000 to $2,000 a month from the blog. And 
that's a that's at the point where you're like, if we can figure some things out here, we could potentially double this. You know, if, if you can make a dollar from a website, you can probably make two dollars. And if you can make two, you can make four. And that equation continues on forever. And so we, we for that phase, when we started to realize that it was an, an actual thing, the one percent infinity started to look for look like um, making intentional business decisions. What are the things that we are going to do as a business to to continue to scale this a little bit each and every day. Um, and I don't think we've by any means perfected the content side. Uh, but, but I think we brought that up to, and, and when I say we, this is Lindsay primarily, but, um, you know, I think it's probably at like, I don't know what she would say, but it's, it's, it's above 80% for sure. And so then you look at other areas, what's at 0% right now? Um, and where, how can we bring that from zero to 80? Instead of trying to get that extra 20% on an area that we feel pretty good about, um, that last phase and that phase that we are right now is looking at areas that are at 0% and bringing them up to 80 or 90% and trying, in, instead of trying to perfect the little tiny things. So an example would be, you know, we had a pretty good idea of ad network. So we got those set up. We had those running on the blog. Realistically, we could probably squeeze another, as it is right now, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 out of ad networks. But we'd be tweaking and we'd be adjusting and we'd be making really small changes to get that extra 10% or 20%. Um, So instead, we're looking at other areas and saying, what's at zero and what can we bring up to 90? And we're taking really small steps with those areas each and every day. So that's 1% 1% infinity for us right now is planting seeds in a garden that has no um, vegetables yet. And we're, you know, waiting for those to grow. We're letting the other gardens um, continue to, uh, you know, have have a harvest. Um, and we're looking at other areas that we need to go to and say, hey, this is a great place for us to start something new. So does that make sense? I love your analogies. That made it, you know, just really kind of come alive, I think, to think of it in that way. And I can totally see that. And I think for a lot of bloggers, that's how it feels because there are so many aspects to this and it's always changing. And so the minute you get a handle on something, then there's something else that pops up or something else that needs your attention. And some people do, you know, I think it's easy to fall into that trap of sort of tweaking and perfecting. Meanwhile, there's something else you could be working on. (laughs) And so, yeah, the tweaking thing is huge. And and I need to constantly be aware of this because it's so easy to get into it. If something is broken or off or, you know, it's kind of like this little subtle poke on on your shoulder. And it's so easy to dedicate all your attention and focus just on that. But the reality is a lot of times those little tweaks and adjustments don't, don't really matter. <laughs> and I think that's one thing I'm learning as I get into it uh, further and further into this world, whatever you know, again, air quotes, this world. Um, but there's just so much opportunity to perfect things that don't need to be perfected. And I think it's a huge issue, not only when you're, when you've built something, but also when you're just starting out, like people can spend weeks and weeks designing the theme for their blog and they don't even have any content yet. And they don't even know if they like writing, you know, they, they haven't gotten into it and don't have any idea if it's something that they're going to actually stick with. Um, so I think that's a huge takeaway for people and something to be really aware of. It's a little, it's a like, it's like a reverse 1% infinity, right? It like steals from that progress because it's such an easy distraction and it feels like progress when so often it's not. I'm a writer. And so in the writing world, a lot of times they'll talk about how you can't move forward if you just keep editing what you already have. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, I used to write like that, like I would write this chapter that would be you know, amazing of this novel, but I would never get past it because I just kept every time I would sit down to write, I would start by rereading that chapter. And I just kept messing with it. And I was like, I have one amazing chapter (laughs) and no book because I keep doing this one thing. So um, I finally figured out how to move past that and kind of come back. But you do have to figure out the right places to spend your time. Um, So you're not so you're not wasting it. So you're not just tweaking things that aren't going to actually make a difference. Because it's important to have great images. But you know, if you're spending two hours on an image and your readers would have been happy with the first image, you know, that you did, you know, after five minutes of editing, then maybe you need to stop. Yeah. (laughs) It's just stop. (laughs) And I think one thing too, to be aware of is that I think you're, when you get into those moments of tweaking and adjusting and fine tuning, I think there's a place for that. Uh, I think it's usually not in the work that we do. Um, and if it is, it's a dedicated time towards the end of the project, whatever it is. Uh, but I think you're, I think it's also important to be aware of that, that as a creator, 
whatever it is that you do, that you're stealing joy from yourself whenever you focus on those little things. Because I think we know the feeling of of doing something significant and big. And it, I, I don't mean significant and big like hit a home run every day, but I mean significant and big in that we're moving forward on something that matters. Um, and, and those that are listening know what that is and, and what that important element is. And if you if you instead you get in and you focus on the things that realistically you know don't matter and don't move you forward, I think there's a little bit of joy that you steal from yourself and knowing that you haven't progressed on that on that big project and understanding that you are stealing joy from yourself because of your decision to focus on smaller things is important to know because I think that helps motivate you to focus on the bigger things. Easier said than done, uh, but it's a super important concept, I think. Yeah, we all have those traps that we fall into. And I think it's different for everybody of what kind of steals the joy and takes the time that, you know, doesn't need to ha- take that time, I guess. For sure. That kind of brings up another issue where I feel like there are two easy and opposite camps that people kind of fall into thinking of this 1% infinity idea. And the first is that you have so many things you want to learn. This is where I'm always at. And so um, there are so many 1% you're excited about that there's like an overwhelm that happens. Yeah, analysis and then this, paralysis. Exactly. Yeah, or I just go in so many directions, I don't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. I don't move forward at all. Yeah. And then the second is there's that plateau where you feel like you're doing the 1% infinity and then you get stuck because you've kind of finished something. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I kind of wonder if you've experienced either or both of those and then, you know, if so, or or even if not, if you have advice on this, like how do you push past a plateau or or on the opposite spectrum, you know, deal with that overwhelm? Yeah, or even the question of how do you know if something isn't working? Like when do you stop? Mm, um, that's great. I think all of those are difficult questions to answer. And I think the answer looks different depending on the work that you're doing. And and the other reality is with all of this stuff that we do, there's there's two equations. There's the is this working and will it be something that will be able to sustain me with an income? So it's more of the business uh, side of things. And then there's the other equation of, is this something that's working that I really enjoy? And I think there's more flexibility in the latter one where if you really enjoy podcasting, but you're not getting momentum with building a following, that's going to look a little bit different than if you're wor- you're really hustling to do something that you maybe don't super enjoy, uh, but you're you know that it's an es- es- essential element um, for whatever it is that you're doing. So I'd say if there's something that you really enjoy and you're not getting a lot of traction with it, and you're not uh, finding that you're building a huge following, I wouldn't be as hard on yourself uh, as I would if you're looking to build something that's more of on the business side of things. So, and I'll speak to that latter one more than I'll speak to the other one because it's a little bit easier because the, there's more of like a, um, a a objective bottom line when it has to do with like building a business or, you know, building a, building something online that you want to create an income. So I think with that, in terms of the plateaus, there's, a few things. There's always the 80-20. So there's looking at the things that you're doing that aren't actually impacting the the bottom line, whatever that is. We'll just use income maybe in this example because it's really easy to use that. It's looking at the things that aren't actually impacting that bottom line, or maybe it's traffic, or maybe it's downloads. Um, And potentially passing those off to somebody that can do it because it doesn't matter if you're involved or not. So an example for us is, you know, I for Food Blogger Pro, we have a forum. And there's anywhere from 100 to 300 posts um, that go up on that. Not new posts, but like interactions and uh, things like that. Well, it's probably, I'd say, 50 to 200 um, a day. And for a while, I was getting all of the notifications for those. And I would go in and I would um, respond to those or I would you know, keep an eye on the conversations and stuff. And I was just getting completely flooded. And my understanding was I need to be in there doing that in order for there to be value with Food Blogger Pro in the forum. And I think there's a piece of that that was true. Uh, But there's also the reality that this was something that I was spending a ton of time on and it was potentially taking away from the real value that I could offer, which was figuring out ways to, you know, make Food Blogger Pro a little bit more scalable, create more content, things that would be more evergreen as opposed to the day-to-day interactions. So I brought somebody into the fold and said, 
would you, you know, we hired somebody, Beth is her name. She's uh, an incredible, we call her our community happiness specialist. And so she, she now gets those emails and that's her job to handle those. Um, that was something that I realized for me was causing a plateau because it kept me from moving forward on the things that were most important. Um, so it, for a while, the, the 1% infinity was stepping back and saying, how can I pause you know, the work that I'm doing, which in this case was forum activity and things like that, in order to bring somebody in so then I can focus on once again working on that 1% infinity for the things that really matter. Um, so in a sentence, it would be figuring out the things that you're doing that don't need you in them and finding a way to either stop doing those, knowing that it's going to be a sacrifice, or to bring somebody in that can do them for you. And that will allow you to focus on the things that are working, you know, the 20%, that's going to allow you to have 80% of the benefit. Um, I think that's been a huge learning curve for us in terms of figuring out ways that we can, or figuring out ways that we can focus on the areas where we don't matter. <laughs> like editing video is one of those. It doesn't matter if we edit video as long as it's really well done. How can we bring somebody in to allow us to focus on the things that really matter? And if you're the people that are just getting started and you don't have a budget to hire somebody, I would say sometimes it just has to be dropping the things that don't matter in order to focus on the things that do. That's super important and really hard to figure out sometimes or admit. I feel like there's sort of some people are really quick to hire somebody for everything and they can't actually afford that because I do know people who do that. Mm -hmm. And then there's kind of the other people who don't want to hire anybody. And I know for me, you know, I don't know how you found podcast editing, but in the beginning, I sort of felt like, man, I really got this. And then I started listening back to some of my first episodes and I was like, wow, the sound is so bad. Mm, yeah, right. <laughs> I thought I was doing this great job. Yeah. And so for a while, I hired someone who is was fabulous and, and is fabulous and really affordable because I was like, I don't need to spend my time there. But what ended up happening is I was still editing the content. So I was still spending just as much time doing, you know, listening to it, even though I was passing off the sound to him. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to podcast movement, I took a session from Marin Bereket, and he taught me how to do sound in 10 minutes post production, cool. which is amazing. And so I was like, well, 10 minutes is how long it takes me to get all the files ready yeah. to send to my sound guy. And I'm already spending, you know, a couple hours after just content editing, listening back, writing good show notes and that kind of thing, because that's important to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's scalable. So we'll have to see. <laughs> I can speed that up. Right. But, but at least, you know, that sort of saved me the time and money. But, you know, for people who are, if you are ever thinking about starting podcasting, it's just if you don't need to and you can avoid it and you can pay somebody to do your sound for you because it's it just really can be this dark black hole that you fall into. I was Googling, you know, videos on how to adjust this and that and, you know, finding all this wrong different information and everything. Just it's I was like, the more I click things, the worse it sounds. Yeah. What and, am I doing? And the reality <laughs> is that it's not just the time that it takes to do it. It's also the time that it takes to learn how to do it. Like those two things are both very time consuming. And the, for you, it, it might be the kind of thing where it's like you that's important to you. And you know that when your touch on whatever it is that you're doing, like show notes, I think is a great example, is something that you want to you want to hold to, you know. And and an example would be like for pinch of yum, we just know that n nobody's ever gonna t take the the photos, but Lindsay, um, at least in the near future, there might be some yeah. posts where you know, kind of more of a generic post, like a review post or something like that, that somebody would handle more of the content. But like that's just something that that it's like Lindsay's never gonna outsource that or have somebody else edit them, um, even though it would be way more efficient and it would be cost effective for us in terms of where we're at. It's just like, no, it's something that is important and we're going to hold to it. And um, so it's, it's, you know, there's, there's this uh, <laughs> uh, meme where the it's, I don't know if it's the guy from the oatmeal that, that did it, but um, he has like this, he, it's a, like a stick figure and then it just has like different phrases for different things. And one of them is, it's like all the things. So it's like outsource all the things. Uh, <laughs> and and I feel like sometimes that can be the mentality uh, for people that are building something online. It's like, well, you can hire somebody in the Philippines for you know, $5 an hour and they can do everything for you. And I think there's some truth to having, you know, building a team and outsourcing. And, and also 
I think people can, that can be a tinkering thing, right? You can perfect this idea of never having to do any work. And, and I think people can see that and understand that they, people want to be connected to the creator. Uh, but there are things that creators do that, that aren't, um, necessary for them to do, you know, um, and, and maybe feel necessary, but I think a lot of times they aren't. Yeah, especially, you know, in terms of what people can see that you're doing. And if they can see your mark, like when you mentioned Lindsay's photos, like, there's a certain style to her photos, I can recognize them, Mm -hmm. you know, a mile away. And I think most of your fans as well, they can the photos are just they have Lindsay's touch. And that would be something crazy to outsource, because I think that's a huge part of the identity for you guys and and your brand and just kind of who you are. So yeah, figuring out, you know, how, how and when to to outsource and get people to help you with those things and what things need your mark and what things don't. And if you get control freaky about stuff, like if you're maybe having someone help you let go, you know, just let it go. Yep. That's not, that's not the thing that needs your time. And so, and sometimes um, what it takes is in order to make yourself feel better about it, it's saying, I'm going to do this as an experiment for a month. Instead of saying, I'm going to let somebody take this over forever and I'm never going to touch it again. It's, it's saying, I'm going to see what happens if I let somebody else do this or if I don't do this, whatever that task is, uh, just to see and to prove to yourself either um, it doesn't need to happen or things continue to move on, right? Like life continues to to go on and in and, and your blog or your website or your podcast or you know your social media following continues to grow even though you're not doing X, whatever X is, um, in your personal time or with your personal time, either somebody else is doing it or maybe you're not doing it at all. I don't know what that is, but I think people that are listening maybe have an idea of what that would be for them. Yeah, that's a great thing for you to be thinking about listeners is what is the what are the things what are the things that you're, you know, spending too much time on what systems could you put in place that are going to help you to be more efficient with the things that you are doing and that you aren't going to give up. And so, yeah, just I I feel like the time management for me sometimes is the is the killer. Mm -hmm. because I'm like, I want to be doing the 1% infinity and um, the time, you know, so so figuring out what systems and what things you can put in place is just yeah. really important. And the reality that usually we overestimate how much time we have, like we, we, we want to get to the gym and we want to eat healthy and we want to build our business and spend time with those that we love. And I think that if you step back and actually schedule those things in to the time slots that that they would need in order to really happen, you start to see like, if I'm going to get seven hours of sleep a night and also do all these things, um, then I'm just going to be running the entire time. Like if you were to look at my schedule today, it's like, I don't really have that much planned. I have this podcast with you. And then we have a a group that I meet with once a week on Google Hangouts. um, And then a 30 minute meeting in the afternoon. And that's for me, that's even a pretty, pretty busy day. Um, I, we're super intentional about trying not to do less, um, not trying to, you know, fill our schedule with everything. So we're running around because it takes so much time to do good work. And we're in a unique situation where, you know, Lindsay and I are in our late twenties and we, we don't have kids. And, and so we have more time for that realistically than some people would. But for those that are listening that have a kid that are working a full-time job, um, that are, and trying to hustle on the side, um, I would say it's worth it to sit down and say, what does my schedule actually look like if I schedule these things out and give the appropriate amount of time that I need? And then it's going back to that equation where you're saying, what do I want to do? Um, plus what do I need to do? And then there's the minus things that I don't actually have to do. And I think that minus part is where a lot of people could spend some time with and say, what are the things that I can drop? What are the things that I can get rid of? What are the things that I can do to clear out my schedule in order to really focus on the things that matter? That's super important. Well, I don't feel like we, you know, I intended to sit down and talk about time management and stuff with you, but this is so helpful and valuable in terms of of getting getting those getting those hours that you need to do the things that you need to do and figuring out Again, what you, you, only you <laughs> need to do mm-hmm. in, in what you're doing for your blog or your business. Yeah, so. and I think it goes back to the 1% infinity where you're not going to be able to take those little steps forward every day if you don't have the time to do it. And uh, it, it's easier than it sounds, but it, it just takes time. Like it, it takes time to improve, to get better, to learn, uh, to create content. 
Um, and you can, you can do it early mornings, you can do it late nights. Um, but also it's like you need sleep. So you have to figure out when that's going to happen. So I think it's a really important concept for people. Yeah. The sleep for me is what totally gets lost because I'm just like, well, I'll just sleep less. Yeah. Right. (laughs) I have more to do. And then everyone suffers. We've got four kids. And, um, of course the night that I'm like, I am going to stay up till two because this has to get done. And that's the night that, somehow all four of them wake up yeah. all through the night and wake me up all through the night and I wake up in the morning and I'm, <laughs> I don't know, I'm like some kind of cartoon monster like yeah, roaring right, through the right. house. It's just bad. Yeah. It's bad for That's funny. For I'm reading a book right now. My friend Andy Traub, who is actually a podcaster and just all around good guy, wrote a book called um, Early to Rise and it talks about this uh, kind of experiment or I, th- I think it's called the Early to Rise Experience. And just getting in the habit of getting up early. So um, for me, that's that's a time where I really practice one percent infinity, where I take time to read and, and and journal, and you know, kind of plot out the day a little bit. So that's been a good thing. A little plug for my friend Andy, in case anybody wants to check out that book. Yeah, you'll have to give me the link. I'll stick that in the show notes to his podcast for as sure. well. Because oh, cool. I'm I'm always listening to new podcasts kind of all the time. Yep. I think I, I don't know how you guys are that are listening, but once you start listening to podcasts, it's like this crazy addiction thing that happens, at least for me. Yeah. And then I'm listening to all the podcasts all the time. And um I was just re-listening to Serial actually this morning. Oh, nice. even though I've already listened to it. Funny. Um yeah, because I've been listening to the Undisclosed podcast, and then I have to go back, and I'm like, wait a minute, what's happening in this story? So, yeah. okay, geeking out on podcasts. For sure. But, um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about membership sites, because I do know we have some listeners who are who either have some membership sites or are planning to create one. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, that's like a giant topic. I know you can't really cover it all in a few minutes, but, you know, if you have – You've been running a successful membership site for several years now. So what advice might you have for people, whether that's like a, a big scale or like, you know, some like specific technical kind of things, but what advice would you give people who are kind of starting to move in the direction of a membership site? Yeah, I think the first thing would be figure out a way to prove if, it, if it's needed. So for us, we did that through a presale. So we did a presale for Food Blogger Pro uh, in November of 2012, I think. Because then we launched February of 2013, so uh, we did a presale, and we actually used that money to then design and develop and build the site. Um, but it was a great way for us to prove the concept, and to, it was kind of like a Kickstarter essentially. So it's like, hey, if we're going to get to this certain point, for us it was ten thousand um, dollars. We didn't set that out as a goal, but that's how much we ended up earning through it. Then we were able to prove, hey, people are going to not only be in here and consume the content, but we know that people are going to be interested in doing it. So I'd consider that. Um, I think that one thing that people have to decide is are you going to do a month to month membership or are you going to do like more of a a course which would be in the online marketing internet world it would be probably a higher price point lifetime access or long time access to content around a specific topic um with the month to month membership you're going to have to make a decision and figure out a way to continually offer value to people Um, because if people come in and they consume the content in a month and then they're done, there's not much reason for them to stick around. Um, So with Food Blogger Pro, we're constantly trying to figure out how can we continually add value? So we've built in, you know, a nutrition label generator. So it's kind of software as a service. Um, We have the community forum that people are a part of and videos, and, and we're continually trying to think what are ways that we can add value? So to encourage people to stay around uh, to make it worth it for them. Um, With a course, it's more marketing on the front end to show people like, hey, here's why this is going to be a valuable thing for you. Um, So I I think that's an important thing for people to consider, you know, to which way they want to go. I don't think there's a right answer. Um, It's more of like a preference kind of thing. Um, And then I would just say you have to consider the fact that it's, if you're especially if you're going to do a month to month membership it's it requires a ton of time and energy um it's not passive income it's totally active income <laughs> uh and i think sometimes there's this um mentality or idea of life on the beach with your sandals and a margarita and you know and then you have a membership site and you have $10,000 <laughs> a month in recurring revenue but it's like man we're working on it all the time and trying to figure out how can we build this thing and and make it a a valuable place. So it's just a ton of time and energy. Um, And then the last thing I would say is don't be afraid to be niche. So we have a super small niche. We're food blogging. 
And you'd think that there'd be like 50 people <laughs> that would be around for that. But the reality is with 8 billion people in the world or whatever it is that you can do any really tiny niche and you can have a decent amount of people that would be interested in doing whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and that makes it easier for people to understand what it is and makes it easier to show showcase the benefit to people. So for us, we're not a blogging site. We're a food blogging site. So we speak specifically to people that are creating content around food. And we say, here's how you can do it. How, here's how you can do it well. And here's the niche things about search engine optimization when it comes to a recipe. Um, and you're just not going to get that with a generic site. So it's a strategic advantage and a, a, a competitive advantage if you're able to knit, create with create a really small niche. And then down the line, you can maybe niche up. Like you can open up the the your focus. But um, I wouldn't be. I would encourage people to focus on a niche. Um, if they're interested in kind of that membership world. That's really helpful. I heard a woman named Maritza Para speak. She talked about that idea of like the super niche. And she talked about sort of her first list that she made money from it was a niche on, um, it was an email list dedicated to dressage horseback riding. And I was, and hmm. I mean, that sounds like a tiny, tiny list. And then also she has another super niche um, she, so she has a couple, like, so she's got a big list and then she has these little lists put in that are pretty small. And it was about, um, a specific type of horse that people breed. And <laughs> I'm like, I can't think of any smaller niche than that. Yeah, right. <laughs> like exactly. that's really tiny. Yeah. And she kind of went through how, even with these tiny, very super niche lists, how she was able to sort of make an income mm -hmm. and a good income off of these really small lists because it was very targeted, which I think sort of, you know, is hard. people, at first, you sort of disbelieve that, but it makes a lot of sense when you kind of get down to it. Yeah, and, and so, you can speak their language, you know, like if it was just generic horse people, you might get people that are really interested in rodeo. And then you might have people that think that rodeo is terrible for the animals, you know, like and then you send out an email about how to start your own it, this is a terrible. <laughs> Clearly, example. we're not in this world. You're yeah, not. You're right. not in the horse world. <laughs> <laughs> but but you could send out an email. I'm going to finish this, even though it's a terrible <laughs> example. Just keep on. Uh, head down, and <laughs> you could send out an email on starting a rodeo, and that's going. It might offend people, but if you have this super niche where you know it's people that breed this certain type of horse, then you can you can speak to them in a way that. They're like, oh, you get me, you understand me, and you know this, as opposed to just really generic terminology and ideas and concepts. Yeah, and I think, like, kind of as this just evidence with trying to come up with these examples for horses yeah, that exactly. are not, I yeah. think, you know, when you're outside of a world, you don't see all those little niches that exist within it. You don't think about it. You think of horse people. And if you're a person who's a horse person, you know there's a million different kinds. And clearly, Bjork and I do not know... <laughs> Sorry, we don't know this kind. Sorry to all of the analogy. people. Yeah. I know, but you know that's not our world, and so we can't speak to it clearly. And um, but the idea still remains that the super niche and thinking about a really targeted audience makes a lot of sense. And mm -hmm. hearing you talk about the membership site just confirms sort of where I'm at that that's something I never want to do. Yeah, <laughs> it's not right now. I'm like I yeah talk about overwhelm. Like that idea of having to. Um, I mean, I know I'm coming up with content constantly as a blogger and podcaster, but, you know, to have to keep it up in terms of a membership site. And and I will say, too, if you're thinking about it, thinking about what value, you know, is it really worth it? Because I did sign up. There's a guy I really like and I, you know, won't use his name because, well, of what I'm about to say. He, I still really like him, but he kind of sent out this email to his list saying, you know, I'm going to do this special group and it's, you know, 10 bucks a month, which seems super, I mean, it is super affordable and, you know, here's what you're going to get. And so I signed up and I was really excited and it turned out kind of what, what we got was more like, um, a weekly email with some links in it. And I was like, you know, yeah. I mean, it's curated by you and you're awesome, but I could find these links. Like I don't, I don't see the value. And he realized that too. And so to his credit, you know, within a, like a, a month later, he kind of sent out this survey and I'm not sure what other people said. I was really nice, but also pretty honest that I was like, I don't know that I see the value. I was actually about to, you know, unsign up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he kind of, I guess that's sort of the feedback he got from everybody because he closed it down and actually gave people a refund. Hmm. But, um, you know, you really need to think about that because he was really excited. And then he kind of was like, well, I can see people don't have time to kind of commit. And I was like, no, it's really just I think you didn't think through the content part because it just wasn't enough right. for 
for that because there are things like the Influence Network, which is a network for sort of um, targeting Christian uh, women bloggers and Mm -hmm. That's ten dollars a month, but they have like six classes, and you can pick a class every month. Yeah, they change every month. That's free, and you get this community and all these different things. And so, I was deciding between that guy's monthly course and the influence network, and I'm like, well, I think I made the wrong choice there because yeah. you know I'm getting an email every week with links in it, and right. that's just not enough. So. Right, it's, it almost feels like something that you'd maybe unsubscribe from, even if you weren't paying for it. Yeah, I mean, I'd be okay because the links were good, but they weren't good enough that I needed to pay for them. Right. I guess, right. and so that's where I'm. I'm pretty picky. I mean, we all should be picky because we don't have unlimited resources, any of us. And there are so many. That this is the thing that's been crazy for me is there's so many things to spend money on as a blogger mm-hmm. and. When I first started, I wasn't spending any money other than sort of my domain and hosting. And then it's like, well, but you get these great tools. Oh, but they cost money. And then you can, you know, upgrade to use, um, you know, Canva for work or PicMonkey with Mm -hmm. the pro feature or whatever. And that's a little bit more money. And then you could add this to your hosting package and that's a little more money. And there's just all these things where the money can go. And so you really need to be discriminating with those. Just like when you're thinking about hiring somebody, you know, is it really worth it to hire that person? Like, is it saving you time? Is it making something that you do better? Is it something necessary? Or could you just quit? Yeah, yeah, there's there's a concept in Y Combinator. And Y Combinator is the uh, startup school, essentially, um, that is, that's built like Airbnb and Dropbox and um, all of these huge companies. And they have this concept that they call um, ramen profitability. And I think it's such an important concept in that it allows you to be profitable right from the beginning. And I think sometimes we have this idea that you need to, you know, lose, like the average business loses money for the first three years, which I think there's some truth to that, uh, especially like brick and mortar. But online, it's a little bit different where you can potentially be profitable right from the get-go. And I would encourage people to think about that. What can you do in order to adjust those revenue and expense categories? So the revenue is a little bit higher than the expenses, even if you're just first getting started, even if it means that, you know, you have to have ramen for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Maybe not that extreme, but the idea being, what are the ways that you can become profitable as quickly as possible? Um, And not that you just want to take that money and spend it, you probably want to take that and put it back into the business in some way, but that's that's why you want to do it is so you can have that money, you can have that income um, where you're not having to pull money from other places in order to sustain what you're doing. Totally. And I feel like I see so many people quick to jump on, you know, and pay for things that they don't know that they necessarily need. Mm-hmm. You know, an example of that is I just started doing uh, free webinars and I'm selling a course. And so everybody's like, get lead pages, get lead pages, get lead pages. And I love lead pages. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I see people using it. I know it's effective, but I haven't sold my product yet. You know, like I don't have, I don't have the, you know, I've already invested in a lot of things this year and I don't have any more to invest. And so for me, I kind of went through and I was like, okay, how can I hack lead pages and basically mimic that, but use my own site and be, and use the knowledge I have about coding and just even like simple coding, copying and pasting, you know, and embedding things. And so I totally hacked a page on my own blog and used that to run my webinar. And I had the chat box and I had the video there and I had a buy button and, you know, that could have paid lead pages. Would it have looked better? Uh, Probably, although I was, you know, a little happy with how it turned out. And, you know, but for me, and I had people kind of saying, well, you, you know, use you, why aren't you using lead pages like that? I was talking to in groups that are also doing courses. And I was like, you know what, you guys, I'm not paying even $25 a month for something that I, I can't use. Now, once I sell thousands of dollars worth of stuff, then maybe I'll go to lead pages so I'm not having to code a bunch of stuff. Yeah. But maybe not, because if I can mimic what it's doing, then why do I need that service? Yep, for sure. And I think the tension there then becomes that 80-20 that we were talking about before, where uh, at what point is it, and and it's going to be different for everybody depending on where you're at, but at what point does it become worth it to then spend that money to not have to spend the time that it takes to do it. And and I think the biggest factor is what you know, what is the time value to what you're doing? And that's like for Lindsay and I, that's really changed over the past six years. Um, because six years ago, like I was working at a nonprofit and Lindsay was a teacher. And like so the idea of like hiring an electrician to come and fix or or the, here's an example so we had a um a water softener that we needed to install um when we first got married and it's like we just th- there was no way that we were going to be able to bring somebody in to um 
install this water softener. So it was like, I watched YouTube videos for four hours and learned how to sweat pipes and then installed a water softener. And the, but as, as Pinch of Yum has grown over the years and as Food Blogger Pro has grown, that equation looks a little bit different where I know that if I can spend um, three hours creating a new course that we can then promote on Pinch of Yum, the potential for that could be you know, X amount of dollars, thousands of dollars. So it, it doesn't make sense for me to like install a water softener now. So I think as you're building a business, that equation starts to change where, um, you know, we, when, when people first start a food blog, we're like, Hey, don't pay $1,500 for a custom designed theme, like buy it or don't, don't even buy a theme, just get a free theme, start using that, get an idea for what it is. Because at this point it makes more sense for you to get a feel for it, to work on it yourself, to get an idea for it. But you know, if somebody is, has been doing it for five or six years, they have a, a solid site, they have a, a good following, they're creating an income from their site, it doesn't make sense for them to, you know, get in and, and create a whole new theme. They, it might make more sense for them to do a, cu a custom theme. So I think that is important for people to figure out is what does that equation look like and how does that change over time? And for you, they'll, I'm sure there'll become a point, um, I'm going to push back against what you said a little bit against lead pages. I think there will be a point as you continue on with this and as you do more webinars where you'll say, you know what, this is totally worth it for me. If I can do one more webinar a week and not have to worry about doing the HTML and coding and, and, and custom design of this page and just have lead pages do it and know that they're going to continually make it better, it's going to totally be worth my time. So that's my prediction for you. I think that time will come and, and I think that it will come soon. I do hope so because I I mean, I, I do love lead pages yeah. and I would like to be able to say like, oh, that's no big deal. Of course I can afford that because I'm selling my course and, and that kind of thing. But I think it'll um, come. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Speak those words over my life. That'll be great. <laughs> well, we've talked for a long time, actually longer than I planned. But for you guys who are not le yet listening to the Food Blogger Pro podcast, it's like a higher level. It's kind of like, you know, we've got 101 kind of podcasts about things and it's like a 301 or like a seminar. <laughs> like you're going to get like not stuff you can't understand, but just things that you're not hearing everywhere else. That's really good. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending so much time yeah, talking really to me too. about yeah. all this. We kind of covered all kinds of things in this interview. So yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me on. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did, although I'm not sure it's possible to enjoy it quite as much as I did because it was just a lot of fun talking to Bjork. But Again, the show notes are at creativewriting.com forward slash 061. And I want you to head over and subscribe to the Food Blogger Pro podcast because as I mentioned in the episode, the Food Blogger Pro podcast is fantastic filled with all kinds of in-depth information and knowledge that's helpful whether you're trying to become a freelance writer. There's a really great episode on that. Or if you are working on trying to figure out what things on your site itself are converting. And he interviews the, I don't know if it's the founder, somebody from Hotjar. So there's a ton of really great episodes on there. And I really enjoy his podcast and just him. He's got great information. So shout out to Bjork. Thanks so much for being on the show. This episode has been sponsored by hollyhomer.com. And if you don't know Holly, you are really missing out. All of these throwback episodes are sponsored by Holly. And I hope you go check out her site, give her some love, go like her Facebook page because she's doing a lot of things in a lot of places and you don't want to miss what Holly's got going on. Thanks also to Jasmine Commerce for the music for the show and you can find her at jasminecommercemusic.com. Before you go, please don't forget to subscribe and I don't just mean in iTunes, which I would love. We're also on Stitcher or iHeartRadio or Google Play, wherever you're listening from, but I'd love for you to subscribe to my actual email list because I send out an email every week, The Quick Fix, and it's resources and links that I think will be really helpful, things that have helped me. It's a great curated list and great resources and information. Also, sometimes some cool freebies that I throw your way. So you can find that at creativewriting.com forward slash subscribe. Thanks so much for listening as always, and I hope you have an inspired week. Oh, oh, oh.